Hello, this is Anthony Effinger. I'm the host of the Think Neuro podcast at Pacific Neuroscience Institute. And today I am talking with Karina Sergi. She is a licensed psychotherapist and she's working with PNI in its treatment and research in psychedelics program or TRIP. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Anthony. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us a little bit about TRIP and what you do there on a daily basis. Yeah. So here at TRIP, um, I'm a study therapist. So we conduct clinical trials uh, using psychedelics, specifically psilocybin, in the treatment of various disorders. And so for our clinical trials, I serve as a study therapist. I'm one of the facilitators that is in the room with the participant as we are delivering psilocybin. And um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but there's some preparation that goes along with that. And then later on, there are psychotherapy integration sessions that we conduct with participants. So psilocybin is the active ingredient in what most people might know as magic mushrooms, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. What makes that compound so good for this, for this kind of therapy and what can it be used to treat? Well, we've seen psilocybin historically and currently show promise in the treatment of things like substance abuse, of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, um, certainly end-of-life psychotherapy. So those who are in palliative care, um, there have been some studies conducted um, showing efficacy in those who suffer from cancer and are facing end-of-life and the existential angst that can go along with that. Um, also, psilocybin has been shown to be to show promise in smoking cessation and the elicitation of the mystical experience. Mm. So, how did it go from being, um, you know, a drug that in, in you know was sort of notorious in the '60s, um, became illegal, was you know part of this you know panoply of terrible drugs that were going to hurt us all? How did it come from there? to now being studied by institutions like PNI, like Johns Hopkins, and like other, other really reputable places as a treatment for these disorders? Well, I think first and foremost, it should be noted that indigenous cultures have been using psilocybin for thousands of years um, in the treatment and the healing of certain disorders. Um, and really, they were used in indigenous cultures in a community and spiritual practice. And so we have data that indicates that psilocybin is not only safe, um, but it can be used for psychological healing. Mm. So, you know, some, there, were, there was kind of whispers about indigenous cultures who were using various psychedelic substances, not just psilocybin, but others as well. And how it came to the West was in 1955, a, a banker by the name of Gordon Wasson Um, took a couple of people, including his wife, to Oaxaca, Mexico, where a woman by the name of Maria Sabina, a shaman, um, was conducting what are called veladas. And veladas are healing ceremonies using psilocybin mushrooms. So Gordon Wasson, um, later, a couple years later in 1957, published an article letting the Western world know that this, this was an option. This was a thing. So he got the ball rolling. He did for the Western, for Western culture. Yeah. But of course it was being used for thousands of years. In yeah. In, our, in Western culture. So literally we, there is, there are, there are centuries of experience exactly out there. And we are just sort of coming back to this now. Right. Uh, because of the, because of the data right now, I, I've seen some incredible, um, incredible data on this. I mean, people have one mushroom experience uh, and are able to stop drinking when nothing else has worked. Is that, am I right about that? Well, certainly there are some people who with one mushroom experience can have, can make dramatic changes in their lives. Um, more often than not, that first experience is the beginning of a journey back to themselves, whether that means that they have more medicine experiences or that they begin a a healing journey, a path um, to change. And so, you know, these these molecules, these substances or medicines um, 
have been shown for thousands of years, but certainly in our modern culture and in current science are showing us that they have they have a property that really can be very healing. And you're doing this in um, in specific settings with specific procedures. This isn't just, um, you know, let's sit around and take some mushrooms and talk about it. There's there's a method here that's quite, quite rigorous. Is that right? Absolutely. Tell us about that. Yeah. So our process includes uh, a series of preparatory sessions. And during those preparatory sessions, we are doing exactly that. We're preparing a participant or a person, whether it's in a clinical trial, whether it's preparation for um, someone maybe going to another country and having some um, psychedelic experiences, perhaps at a retreat center or or, um, with indigenous shamans or any other psychedelic experience that they're going to have. Preparation is very important. Um, We want to make sure that a person feels comfortable, feels safe, um, and that they understand what they're getting themselves into. You know, the psychedelic experience can be pretty difficult at times. And so we want to coach participants. We want to let them know what they may encounter psychologically, physiologically, and help them understand what to do. It start the preparatory experience starts with intention setting which typically answers the question, why have you come to this medicine experience? What would you like to get out of it? Or how would you like to be different as a result? And that gets people thinking, mm. why am I here? What, do I, what am I trying to do? Do I just wanna have a psychedelic experience? I don't think so. More likely they're here to heal something or to treat a condition that they haven't been able to treat with conventional therapy. So it starts with intention. And then we talk about safety We talk about what to expect the day of the dosing session. Um, And then we talk about what to do if they face challenging material. And that is always to face it, Mm. turn to it, to approach it, right? Don't run away. Don't run away from the dragon, from the monster, from the giant eagle or anaconda that you might see during Mm. the session. These are typically, um, this, this could be information directly from, from the medicine. It could be, it, it certainly could be material from the unconscious mind. But for people who have spent a lifetime running from the pain or the discomfort of their condition or of, of life in general, this can be very new and difficult. And so we let them know that we'll be there with them throughout the process, but that the idea or the goal is to turn toward the scary thing. Mm. Ask it, what are you doing here? my mind? What have you come to to teach me? What have you come to help me do? And that's when we start to see some remarkable information and remarkable shifts and change. In your role, you're with the, you're with the subject who's, who's um, going to take the journey before, during, and after, is that right? Correct. So after we prepare, we've done a few preparation sessions with the participant, they're ready for their medicine day. And the medicine day is generally a very calm, um, pretty quiet day. So in other words, there's not a lot of activity. We don't want people feeling stressed. We want people to feel relaxed and ready, right? There are, there, there are a couple of terms that we use in psychedelic work, set and setting. And that has to do mm. with a person's mindset. How are they feeling? What are they thinking about prior to a medicine experience? And the setting, the environment. So we try to create a very tranquil, calm environment so that they're not being distracted by anything going on around them. The lights are dimmed. We're pretty quiet. We're not asking a whole lot of questions. And we allow people to come in early, to start to stretch, to start to meditate, to do some breathing, um, and check in with them briefly prior to giving them the medicine. So that's what the dosing day is like. And that's a long day for a participant. It's usually an eight or nine hour day. Hmm of those hours being with us, the facilitators in the treatment room. And you're sitting in a treatment room now, right? I am. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of what this looks like is. Yeah. You get the idea, you know, um, things are pretty benign in here. Um, Nothing that's going to evoke anything emotional. Um, It's just a tranquil, calm room. And are people always wearing headphones with music or sounds on them or is how does that work not necessarily so we do have headphones available um but sometimes we just play the music 
um, just ambient music in the room. Um, we can always hear what the participant is hearing, whether they have headphones on or not. Mm. So we're, we're following them along in the process. But certainly the, there's music playing. Um, we encourage our participants to use eye shades. So we have very comfortable eye shades that they, that they wear. They're lying on a couch and um, they have really very comfortable blankets and pillows. We encourage people to bring um, anything that they might feel especially comfortable with that day whether that's their own blankets and pillows, comfortable clothing, or some objects from home that might be grounding for them, um, or that they might want to use to cue a certain material in their in their session. For right now, um, a person can't just go out and do a psilocybin experience uh, outside of a clinical setting. Is that right? Because of the the, the laws. Not in this country, correct. But not there, in this country. There are other countries um, where psilocybin ceremonial work is legally sanctioned uh, and psychedelic assisted therapy with the use of psilocybin is legally sanctioned. So certainly that's happening outside of this country. But at PNI, you're doing it under the auspices of um, a clinical study on alcoholism. Is that right? That's correct. So okay. you no, know, we have permission from the FDA and the DEA to deliver this medicine to folks who are suffering from alcohol use disorder. Yes. Because it's shown to be such a powerful, uh, it could be a very powerful um, treatment. And that's, that's why right. the FDA is right. Okay. So what have you, and you're leading these sessions, you've done how many of them in, under the trial? Well, there have been, there, there are 20 participants in total, and we're just finishing up with the last two. And for this particular study, each participant it participated in two psilocybin sessions. So there was no placebo for that trial. Everybody got two psilocybin sessions, which is really remarkable. Interesting. Yeah. And I faci- I've probably facilitated maybe 13 or 14 of those. So, you know, 13 or 14 times two between 26 or 28 psilocybin sessions that I facilitated here for PNI. How did you choose to do two? Well, that's a question for the uh, principal investigators. Um, but I think, you know, if I had to guess... Uh, they were probably recognizing that what's true for most people, which is that the first session really helps you acclimate to the medicine. In other words, Mm. learning, especially for those who are psychedelic naive. So some people Mm. never, you know, had a psychedelic experience and now we're giving them a very strong psychoactive drug, right? We're giving them psilocybin. It can be a little bit dysregulating. And so first just learning how to traverse that territory and feeling Mm. with us Um, and acclimating to the medicine experience and then kind of integrating that for a few days or actually a few weeks. And then they have a second chance, right? So now there's a second medicine experience. They've kind of, they've got, they've got some experience under their belt um, and they can, they can kind of decide what they'd like to do and what they want their intention to be for the second, for the second experience. It's, it's really very very a smart thing to do. And the experience lasts about how long? Five or six hours? Yeah. So they're in the room with us for six hours in total. Um, and people generally start to come around, you know, for air and start to want to stretch and talk um, around the fourth or fifth hour, depending on how quickly a person metabolizes the medicine. Tell me about the history of the therapeutic use of psychedelics. When does this start? Well, I think if we're going to talk about the the real history of the therapeutic use of psychedelics, we have to include um, indigenous communities. So, you know, something like 4000 BC, we there's evidence of cave paintings um, of, of folks using psilocybin. And so we can make some assumptions of why they might be doing that. And there might be a lot of different reasons, but I, I can assume that it would, would also be for therapeutic reasons. Um, We know that in 3700 BC uh, in the Americas, there is evidence of ceremonial use of peyote in indigenous cultures. Um, And in 1300 AD, there's evidence of the Aztecs using mushrooms, um, calling them the flesh of the gods. And so certainly we know that indigenous cultures were used, ancient indigenous cultures were using uh, these medicines for all sorts of reasons. It might be for to prepare for battle. It might be to prepare for hunting. Um, and we can assume that they were also using these for the healing of problems that were occurring in their community. Well, ceremony and ritual is often about that, right? About 
healing the community or uh, getting, you know, getting right with, with your divinities. Right. Right. So that's, yeah. 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 The point is these, these were not, these are not party drugs um, for those people. They were doing something much more profound with them. They may have been used in celebration. Celebration is an important part of healing as well. Sure. Good point. (laughs) But, but they were being used strategically. Right. So tell me about the, the more modern history. Bring us up to date, like specifically um, LSD. There's some wonderful stories about its discovery. Is that right? Well, we know that Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman or Hoffman originally synthesized LSD in 1938. And then, you know, kind of looked at the compound, couldn't really find any clinical usage for it. And so put it on the shelf for another five years. And in 1943, on a hunch, picked it back up off the shelf and accidentally intoxicated himself uh, with LSD. And there's a great story that on April 19th of that year, 1943, Albert Hoffman um, intentionally um, allowed himself to be um, affected by LSD. I'm not sure exactly how. I don't know if he took it orally or if he just kind of let it, you know, sit on his fingers. Um, but we call that bicycle day because he rode his bike home and had a tremendous trip. So he took probably two or three times the amount that we mm. do clinically now. So you can imagine that he had a wild experience and went home and eventually wrote a trip narrative and let us all know what he experienced um, in that time. And so um, clearly there were some psychoactive effects. And from there, uh, people really started to become interested in the therapeutic use of LSD in particular. And that's when we found um, people who, you know, psychiatrists and therapists who were interested in utilizing this compound, Hmm. especially for for addiction. That early on, they were working, they they saw the promise for addiction that early on. Well, I think... we, what they were looking at was that there were treatment resistant disorders and we know addiction to be a, something that's really difficult to treat, right? It's a condition that, that that's difficult. And so here was a new tool, just like as excited as we are now for using these mm. tools, they must've been just as excited and started using them um, for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. And you know, at that time in the forties and fifties um, you could write to Sandoz laboratory. Um, as a professional, as a clinician, and say, hey, I'm using this for research purposes. Can you just send me a vial? And Sandoz would send it to them. And so, you know, in, in a lot of ways, that was a wonderful thing because clinicians got their hands on the on this compound and could really do really great work. But you can also imagine that it got in the hands of people who maybe shouldn't have had it or who were using it in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. And so that's when we saw later on um, some dangerous use of LSD, which eventually led to a lot of wonderful things, but also some some things that we should all be concerned about and that we shouldn't forget that these compounds are um, very strong and should be used with respect with the proper set and setting. Yeah. Yeah. And we know some of the history with LSD and um, uh, the CIA and Timothy Leary and, and it's got, it, it had a mixed history for a while, but the long and short of it is we've learned a ton and in therapeutic sessions. Now we're using this um, with great care. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Very much aware of um, how careful we have to be with these compounds. Certainly. And now a message from our sponsor, the think neuro podcast is brought to you by Pacific neuroscience Institute foundation, a nonprofit 501 C three organization. If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org slash foundation. So what it, can you talk at all about what you've seen so far? I mean, obviously in anonymous terms and broad, broad strokes, because this is, you know. Yeah. And, you know, this is, this is a study um, in which we haven't really looked at the data in detail yet because we're not, we haven't completed the study. We still have right. participants that are, that are in the middle of, of, you know, finishing their sessions. Um, and this is of course, because of that, it's unpublished data. Um, what I can say in general is that um, our participants have tolerated the medicine experience very well. Um, 
and that it's been a great honor um, and a great privilege and and one of the most exciting uh, professional experiences of my life to see some of these transformations and the differences that um, this therapy along with psycho uh, psychotherapy have delivered. It's really, it's really been remarkable. So you've seen people have some profound experiences and make some progress on their personal journeys. I have. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, Dr. Kelly, uh, Dr. Dan Kelly, the founder of PNI thinks that uh, psychedelics are the most exciting thing he's seen in neuroscience and, you know, maybe in his career. I can't remember if he said that or just in the last two decades, either one is quite something. Do you agree that this is a game changer? Absolutely. 100%. Um, I don't think it's the only game changer, though. I think that um, this may be the beginning of our profession looking at alternative therapies differently. Mm. So there are other modalities, other tools that we can use, um, even other medicines that don't have psychoactive effects. Um, things like breath work, things like... Uh, mm cacao. Um, When we include psychotherapy, community, and follow-up care with these alternative therapies, we're seeing some differences, um, some changes, some game changers. You know, the, who was it is um, uh, some of the early um, experimenters with uh, psychedelics said, you know, it's a quick way to sort of get uh, to the effects of a long-term meditation practice. Mm. It's a shortcut in a way. I think, you know, people like Sam Harris, the neuroscientist will say that, that it's, it's not a substitute for say uh, a really robust meditation practice, but it's a, it's a way to kind of get there a little sooner, especially if you are, you know, in a kind of a crisis, like with alcoholism or drug abuse or certainly uh, depression. Is that, does that sort of jibe with what you have seen? Absolutely. You know, people talk about um, psychedelic assisted therapy being like, you know, dozens and dozens of hours of psychotherapy in one. Mm. And certainly, you know, I've seen that happen. I've seen people have um, realizations or come to insights and realizations that perhaps they have already in talk therapy but there's something about the psychedelic experience. There's a certain quality we call a noetic quality that just, it, it hits you differently. It feels like, oh my goodness. Yeah. I should be taking care of my body. It's like, well, you knew that you had to take care of your body, but all of a sudden the insight has come to you in such a way that um, you really feel inspired and you're really getting the message. So there's a difference there. And we see it time and time again, mm. with our participants. Yeah. Why do you, and this, so the, the amazing thing to me in looking at this is it, it sounds like there are cases where people have been chronic alcoholics, have had terrible time with drug abuse and have not been able to kick any of those, those habits, but they take, I've heard literally one, you know, psychedelic trip mm-hmm. and have been able to stop drinking. Like, I think that's in the literature. And why do you think, why do you think this has that capability? What, what is, do we know what is happening to make that occur? Well, one of the things that we are seeing um, as the scientific community at large is that the mystical experience seems to make a big difference for our, for participants. And that mystical experience seems to be that that peak experience that people tend to have with psychedelics. And that includes things like a feeling of oneness with the universe, Mm. humanity, with nature. Um, You know, uh, that noetic quality that I talked about before. So receiving information in a way that they haven't before where they just know this is the truth. This is mm. right for me. Um, it, some people describe it as a download. So, you know, like I just downloaded this information and I just, I know this is right for me. This is, this is what I need to do and how I need to move forward. And again, it's hitting differently than it typically does in talk therapy. Um, some people talk about contact with the divine, mm. even people who are 
purport to be agnostic or atheist, feel like they've talked to God or that they were in the presence of God um, or of other deities, deities that they may have never had contact with before or even know a whole lot about. There's also in the mystical experience, there's a certain paradoxicality about it. In other words, they can suddenly hold two very different thoughts or feelings um, that normally would be opposed to one another. So for instance, I've died, but I've never been more alive. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like we, we have a hard time eliciting that in regular talk therapy. <laughs> you know, we're not going to, we're typically not going to get there in the talk therapy experience. And then um, within the mystical experience, people describe an ineffability, which is the quality of not being able to describe it in words. Mm. They've had an experience and they've really felt it and they've known it, but they can't quite describe it in words. These are the qualities of the mystical experience. And that tends to be what sets psychedelics apart from other modalities of treatment. Because they, you, you, you see these things um, in a very clear way, a very, um, I guess I'm not visceral, I guess, but. It can be visceral. The body can certainly be involved. Yeah. Do you find that people, do people tend to talk a lot during these sessions? Do they not talk at all? Is there a. Yeah. Most people don't talk very much. Um, We encourage people to come up for air every so often. Uh, So they may talk a little bit, Uh, you know, they may lift their eye shades, take off the headphones and just say like, you know, I'm still here. I'm doing okay. And we'll check in anything that we can be helpful with. You need to use Hmm. the room, you know, um, but for the most part, people are inwardly focused. And mm. We may see some crying. We may see some tremors, movement of the body. In fact, um, we offer our participants the um, opportunity to be on the floor, on the ground as well. So we may put a mat down. And a lot of times people can work out some, some, somatic, um, some somatic things. So in other words, they might tremor, they might stretch, they might shake. Um, so, yeah. So it's kind of, it sounds like it's mostly an in, so far what you've seen is mostly inward Mm -hmm. exploration and then probably a fair amount of talk afterward or in the integration portion. So most of the talking happens during the integration sessions, the post-dosing, post-medicine sessions that are are like regular psychotherapy talk sessions. How long after this, the session do you hold that? The integration? Our first one is the next day. The next day. Okay. And how, and tell me what goes on there. What have you seen so far there? Well, you know, integration can be as unique as the person themselves. And so, you know, it's hard to say that it's hard to describe exactly what psychedelic integration is like for an individual, because it really depends on their personality, their intention, um, the experience that they had. But in general, uh, psychedelic integration sessions are really about listening for the insights that have emerged during the medicine session, and then eventually developing a way to, um, to enact those insights, right? So to, to create, create some change in a person's life, to change their behaviors, to change the way they treat themselves and other people. I like to talk about psychedelic integration therapy as a journey back to yourself. Mm. And that very literally, taking care of yourself, loving yourself, recognizing that you are, that a person is um, made of several psychological parts. And some of those parts may have been ignored or neglected for decades. And so starting the process of really learning about what a person's needs are, um, how they've been um, treated in the past, how they've treated themselves, what traumas they have endured, and really walking um, alongside a person on that path and um, reminding them what their original intention is and really helping them to develop a plan for change. What sort of people, ha- um, is, again, is this a way to generalize this, the type of person that you're getting uh, who's interested in being a part of the trial? Well, typically, people who are interested in psychedelic therapy, especially in uh, a clinical trial, are open. Uh, they're adventurous. Mm. But we also find that people who come to psychedelic work are desperate. 
In other words, they've tried many different treatment modalities and nothing has worked. And so they're really looking for something different. And they're willing to face their own fears um, and their own qualms about taking a very strong psychoactive medicine in order to reach their treatment goals. And so I have a lot of admiration for the folks who, who come to this treatment. Oh my gosh, yes. You know, Dr. Henserling, who, whom you work with, yes. um, described this the psychedelic experience as getting kind of the record needle out of the groove where it's skipping. Yeah. Does that, does that seem, does that ring, does that ring true to you? Absolutely. We see that neurologically. Um, but as a psychotherapist, I see that uh, psychologically as well. I see people who have had uh, long-term behaviors that are really hard to change. Mm especially as we get older and the brain is less plastic. Um, I've seen people uh, in a very short period of time willing to make pretty dramatic and drastic changes in their lives. So absolutely, you know, behaviors that we practice over and over again become very difficult to change. And there's something about these psychedelic medicines that change us physiologically, neurologically, and psychologically and allow us to um, allow us to be more willing to make, make those changes that we may not have been willing to change in the past. When you say psychedelic medicines, you're talking about psilocybin and what else? What else is on the table right now for people mm -hmm. in the States anyway? Yeah. So in clinical trials, um, psilocybin is available. LSD is available. Um, there, are, there are a couple of forms of DMT, dimethyltryptamine, that are being studied as well and have been studied in the past. Um, and you know, there, there's also, uh, there's also ibogaine or that comes from the iboga plant that, that people have a lot of interest in right now, and especially in terms of the treat, especially in terms of the treatment of addiction. Um, and so, you know, there, there are a lot of, a lot of, of these compounds that are, that people have a lot of interest in because we know that historically they've um, allowed for healing of treatment resistant disorders. Is the DMT experience qualitatively different, different from LSD psilocybin experiences? Every medicine has its own signature. Okay. And um, every medicine has a different duration. So LSD is a very long trip could be up to 10 hours, right? Um, psilocybin six, seven or eight hours. 5-MeO-DMT tends to be a very short experience, anywhere from 10 to 40 minutes. Hmm. Um, and it, it's also um, a pretty intense experience. So things like um, the DMT, the psychoactive um, effects of DMT in the indigenous brew ayahuasca is a, is a far longer process than, you know, injecting or smoking 5-MeO-DMT or even an MDMT. And so route of administration matters, um, you know, wh whether somebody's um, taking the medicine orally or through IV or through intramuscular injection, um, all of these things matter in terms of uh, the experience itself. So is DMT a derivative of ayahuasca? DMT. Or are they the same? DMT is, is one of the um, chemical compounds found in ayahuasca. The ayahuasca brew, depending on the indigenous culture that is using it, may contain several different psychoactive compounds. But, the, but primarily when we talk about ayahuasca and the psychoactive effects of ayahuasca, we're considering DMT. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have a friend who's been to Peru twice um, for ayahuasca journeys, um, yeah. and they've been profound life-changing uh therapy for her uh i'm glad to hear that yeah uh, it sounds extraordinary what um what drew you to this to this work yeah that's a good question it's something that i think about a lot actually um you know if, if i'm being honest anthony um desperation drew me to this work and hmm. and, and that's because um as a psychotherapist we become very involved in um, the outcomes of our clients. We really want people to get better. 
you know, we don't want to keep them in treatment forever. So we're invested in their well-being and their healing and their functional outcomes. And there, there were a subset of my clients and of, you know, clients in the psych- psychological community. You know, I was talking to my colleagues and, and talking to other professionals and finding that there was a subset of, of individuals who were just not being helped with traditional therapies. So things like traditional talk therapy, medication management, mindfulness techniques, mm. changes in their lifestyle, nothing was, was moving the needle. We weren't seeing significant change and people were still suffering. And so, you know, as a professional, I felt an ethical obligation to look to the literature and find out what other options there were. And there were several other options. Psychedelics weren't the only option. There are things like TMS. Um, there are things like TMS. Sorry. What's that? Yeah. So TMS, um, and I don't know a whole lot about it and I'm not a TMS practitioner, but it's, um, a form of therapy that uses mag- magnets that are placed around. Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. And those are usually between like 35 and 40 treatments that a person undergoes oh my. for depression or for anxiety. And a lot of times those are folks who have, who have suffered for a long time and haven't been helped by traditional therapies. And so, you know, I, I looked into all of these therapies and what was most exciting for me was the prospect of a tool that had been used for thousands of years in indigenous cultures. You know, it wasn't um, something new that had just come around in the last few decades. We, I could read the literature and I could also read the history books and see what was going on with these medicines. And so I had a sense of, you know, I felt like maybe this would be safe and this would be um, certainly effective. And so what I did was I enrolled in a year-long certificate program in San Francisco at the California Institute of Integral Studies and um, completed that certificate program where many of the teachers and researchers who have been at this for decades, um, since the 50s and 60s, came and taught us um, what they learned throughout all that research and through all that time. So we learned from the best. We learned from the masters. Wow. People have been doing this since the fifties and sixties. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You forget, I forget about the long, you know, history. I mean, we talk about centuries and millennia and um, I mean, this is not just like a new thing on the block. It's just that our generation or our, we're just new to it really. Well, we'll, we're new to it for a very good reason, and that's because in 1970, um, the Controlled Substance Act shut all of this research down. And that's for various reasons that we won't get into in this conversation, but um, it happened. And so the research was stagnant for many, many decades. And although there were some people who, you know, still had some permission um, later on in the 90s to to, um, begin this research again, wasn't a whole lot of folks. And so we really owe a lot to the researchers who kept on, even in the face of um, ridicule. Mm. And, you know, really, and some of those people risk their careers in order to to keep touting this therapy that it was, that it worked because they knew that it worked. They had seen that it worked um, in the fifties and sixties. So you know, we're repeating a lot of the research that was done back then for a number of reasons, you know, um, including the fact that we're aware of some of the subtler threats to the validity of that research. It was a different time. And so their their processes were different. Their ethics were different. So we're repeating some of the same research. And, you know, if we, you look at the literature, we're, we're finding similar results. These, these, these compounds are effective in the treatment of, of certain conditions. Yeah, you know, when you talk about the um, the folks who stuck with it, um, there's an organization called MAPS. Yes. What What does that stand for? Um, it's the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science, I believe. Is that it? Yeah. They have been dogged about this. There's the, the founder there has just been pushing. And I know that or, here in Oregon, we have um, new laws that make the therapeutic use of psilocybin legal. And I know that they consulted heavily with the the MAPS folks. Yeah, that's a good idea. Rick Doblin deserves a lot of credit. Yeah, that's his name. Yeah. Yeah. We're keeping on and and really believing specifically in in the power of MDMA for the treatment of of post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Was he mostly about MDMA? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you don't count that. We don't count that as a psychedelic. We call it, we count that as um, something else, but, but val- very proven to be very, very valuable for. Well, if you, if you ask Doblin, he would certainly count it as a psychedelic. Oh, he would. It has psychedelic properties. Yes. Interesting. What's next for PNI uh, in terms of clinical studies and psychedelics? Well, we are very excited about the future of psychedelic medicine and certainly um, being a hub for clinical trials here. So we are hoping to treat a number of disorders uh, with psychedelic medicine. We're hoping to use psilocybin, certainly LSD or MDMA as those, um, as those, those compounds become more accessible to us. And you know, we would love to, to use these compounds in the treatment of, of treatment resistant disorders. So addiction, PTSD, grief, uh, smoking cessation, things that are, that people just have trouble with. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff you encountered that where you, you felt for your patients and they just didn't feel like you had the, the right tools in the, in the, in the toolbox yet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, they talk about using psychedelics for a, a wide variety of conditions. I've even heard for like um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, because, because the, the research was halted, um, you know, in, in the seventies, we don't know uh, all mm. of the benefits of these compounds. And so that's what this Renaissance is really about. It's about finding um, finding out what medicines are appropriate for what conditions and how each of these medicines can, can help a person reach their, their therapeutic goals. Mm. To see a time when we are allowed to use these medicines um, with professionals for, you know, self-optimization and growth and, you know, not just for folks who, who necessarily have, are suffering from treatment resistant disorders, but people who, who perhaps are having just general trouble in life. Life is difficult, you know, life is traumatizing. And so um, I'd like to see a time when we can use these compounds for, for anybody that it's appropriate for. Have you, have you read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind? I have. What, do you, what did you think? I think it was an excellent account of what we know now, the current research. Um, I'm especially impressed with anyone who is willing to um, experience these medicines themselves and report back to other people, right? This is, this is really personal material that you mm. to share with us. Um, so overall, very impressed. However, um, we do talk as a, as a psychotherapeutic community about the pollen effect, um, you know, which is the idea that psychedelics are perfect and wonderful and they're appropriate for everybody and everybody's going to have a really life-changing experience. That's just not true. And so we should be clear that uh, psychedelic medicine is not necessarily for everybody. Not everybody's interested in Mm -hmm. having these experiences and that's perfectly okay. Um, There are certain conditions which haven't been investigated well enough for us to know which medicine would be appropriate for which present clinical presentations. And so there's, there's a lot of work to do. And I also think it's important that we realize that um, preparation is extremely important in this process. I don't think that it's a good idea for people to just go home and, and try these very powerful um, medicines on their own without support. Yeah. And that's the difference, right? That's what I perceive as a big difference now versus, you know, you know, in the past people taking these things unsupervised um, and recreationally, I mean, this is a different, this is a different ball game. This is, this is working towards something with preparation and integration. Uh, That's correct. In every experience. And I should be clear, I I don't have anything against the recreational use of psychedelics um, if it's done properly with the proper set and setting and support. Um, I just don't, I I don't have a big interest in the recreational use of psychedelics. As a therapist, I am primarily interested in the therapeutic use of these medicines. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
Well, this is great. This is uh, tremendous work you're doing, and I can't wait to hear more about uh, the studies and, and what we learn. Um, because this truly is, this, it sounds like it could be truly revolutionary for a lot of people who are struggling with um, very difficult conditions. I certainly hope so, Anthony. You know, I'm, I'm dedicating this next portion of my career to this work for a reason. Um, I'm very excited about the prospect of these medicines. And, and certainly I'm very proud of the work that we're doing here at the Trip Clinic at PNI. We're really, really delivering really beautiful experiences to people. So I'm really proud of us. Mm, that's wonderful. Karina, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.